Bird, 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 bird! Round Babe was right. Round Babe was right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it is, uh, well, what is it? It's, I know it's June. I know I had my colonoscopy, that was a sick... It's June 9th. Oh, I'll be damned. And on my calendar it says, Film in the Kennel. We did, uh, we did about a four-hour question and answer videotaped. I wouldn't call it a podcast whatsoever, and we don't even have a name for it, but it will be up on the Hunting Dog Podcast YouTube channel. And what we did was we brought in Scott, Ted, Trent, Heather, myself, all people who have trained dogs at different levels, high levels, low levels, or no levels, and our do's and don'ts, our travel, our food, and then we fielded some questions on, like the people who write into the Upland Institute, we fielded those as we were a trainer, and it was a great conversation, and what we're going to do is we're going to chop that up and get sexy little titles for every segment. And it'll be on the YouTube channel coming up, so look for that. If you haven't checked out the Hunting Dog Podcast YouTube channel, we're going to keep putting more stuff out there, and uh, we just we just love doing it. And, you know, in my efforts to explain what I've been doing and what you'll be getting, and, and, I'm, and I was like, well, your intros are already long enough. Now you're going to go into this diatribe about... We were doing this on Tuesday, and I had a colonoscopy on Thursday. And by the way, it came out pretty good at my age. You know, a couple polyps, no big deal. I survived. Um, so it looks out, you know, for those of you who, who love the show, looks like I'll be around for a while. For those of you who hate the show, sad news for you, looks like I'll be around for a while. Got a better chance of me dying in Las Vegas in August than you do of me dying of colon cancer. So how, how about that? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'll also be going to Pennsylvania for the Versal Hind Dog Federation. I'll be judging Friday, Saturday, and Sunday next week. So if you're in that area, look it up. Come out and say hi. We're gonna be doing some podcasts there. You can find all about. You can find out all about the Versal Hunting Dog Federation, where we don't have any issues, any issues with property, with protest, with wokeness with sleepness. No, it is just a great organization that I am, I'm, I'm proud to judge with. It, uh, it's, it's just a great system. Anyway, we're going to be doing some podcasts all about that system, that judging, that testing, how it differs than other, than other versatile testing. And I know what you're saying. You're like, Ron, if you're trying to make the intro shorter, you're making them longer. Just, you know, Ron, just get to the point where you tell us Onyx is the title sponsor of this show. You don't do anything without them. We don't do anything out of them. We know that. Tell us that Gunner Kennels is the world's only lifetime guaranteed crash tested transportation kennel for your dog. Safest thing, let alone their dog bowls, their food boxes, or food crates, their bumpers. All right. Come on, Ron, just get to it. Tell, don't forget to tell us, Ron, that. W Supply is where you go to get the best service in the world on dog supplies. And, and, and God forbid, Ron, don't forget to tell us that, you know, Garmin. Garmin is what you put around your dog's neck. And what I would, I'm, I would normally say is about 90% of the, the, all the dog people in here today, all dog trainers, guess what? All got Garmin around their dog's necks, right? And of course, then you'd be saying, hurry up, Ron. Get to the canine athlete part. Get where we can get our first order off 25% from canine athlete by using the code K9athlete. Come on, Ron. Tell us that Mossberg has more shotguns and more styles and more skews and more barrel lengths and more length of pulls and more actions. Just come on, Ron. Get to it. Tell us that. And, and oh, Ron, don't forget to tell us that Boss Ammunition is the world's only. World's. I don't mean, 
I don't mean this continent. I don't mean this country. You know, come on, Ryan, get to the point. Tell us about Boss Ammunition, Copper Plated Bismuth. You know, you still got to hit them, but if you hit them, you get them, right? And of course, we know that we're going to talk about Purina Pro Plan. You know, that is the only dog food that I have fed my dogs for, boo, I don't know, what was it? What did I say? I always say around 30 years, probably closer to 40 these days. I'm feeling, I'm feeling nostalgic. And Walton's, I just got the Walton's vacuum sealer, the vacuum, what do they call it? Vacuum chamber sealer. Wow. You could do everything besides bake bread in this thing. It's got a setting for marinating. So what my wife and I just did is, see, see what it, this is how, this is how these intros get so long. I can't help, you know, I'm trying to do like second person, third person, come on, Ron. And then I get right back in. Anyway, I'll do a demonstration. Look for that on Instagram. They, one of the coolest things is, you know, you can, you can set this, this chamber sealer for marinade. So like when we get some salmon, like I don't fish, you know, people give me fish and all these sell some really great salmon to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, Walton's in your kitchen. It's like having Boss in your Mossberg. It's like having Garmin around your dog's neck. It's like giving canine athlete to your dogs. It's that's what Walton's like. Marshware. Uh, you will see on YouTube. You're gonna see the coolest Marshware top that I was wearing. This is my summer go-to top. And of course, you would also say, Ron, hurry up, get to the discount part, so all listeners can get. Marshware for 15% off with the promo code HDP15. Just like Walton's, you can get HDP10 for 10% off. And of course, we know that patrons get a bigger discount. But how many of you are actually yelling at the microphone or the speaker in your car saying, what, what do you say, patrons? Ron, explain patrons. Now, you know what patrons are. They're the people who, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I'm, I'm not going to say it this week. In four-wheel camper, I will be sleeping in my four-wheel camper this Wednesday night on my way to Pennsylvania, and I'll be sleeping in it on my way back. Fortunately, I'm going to get to stay in a person's house in a, in a, in a nice comfy bed, but the, the king-size bed on the, on the upper bunk of that four-wheel camper, it's almost like being at home, and you have all your gear with you. You can bring your, I'm, literally everything, you can bring everything Everything of my sponsors can go in my four-wheel camper cap. So there. And then I'm going to be kicking out the new Arxis boot that I just got. If you haven't seen it, go to Instagram. I did a video about opening them up and putting them on and how I like them and why I like them. The ArxisUSA.com. A-R-X-U-S. Okay. And I'm going to go into I'm, I'm trying. Look, it's like seven minutes. Seven and a half. All right. 7.40. You know, Gumleaf USA was a longtime sponsor of this podcast. Everybody loved these boots. These are these were real European handmade rubber boots with real rubber. We're not talking polypropylene. We're not talking shit that crazy. Real. And Jack, fortunately, Jack Butler found another boot company. And this one's from Sweden. And it's Arxus, A-R-X-U-S, USA dot com. Check out the website and check out the boot bag. Well, check out my Instagram site because that's where I showed the boot bag. And I'm telling you, even though, well, all right, I think, I think. Did I get it all? I, I did, right? I said Onyx, Gunner, W, Garmin, K9 Athlete, Mossberg, Boss Shot Shells, Purina Pro Plan, Waltons, Marshware, Four Wheel Camper, of course my Patreon patrons, and Arxis Boots. Arxis boots. I, I mean, I don't know what else I could do. I mean, even that took me eight minutes. You know, I'm just like my mother. She couldn't tell a story unless you had time to sit down and listen. And I guess I have the same propensity. That's a big word. I'm going to use that word twice every week now. Propensity. Does your dog have the propensity to drop game on the way back to you? Well, try the Upland Institute. If you want to teach your dog the train to retrieve. Yeah, well, you know, I just threw that in. Um... RGS members, RGS members, okay, which I know a lot of you are, Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, check out the summer issue and you will find an ad in there for the Upland Institute. You will then see a barcode or a, what do they call that, a QR code, 
okay? That's how old I am. I, I remember barcodes. I remember tattoos on arms. Um, you will see a QR code in there. And RGS members get a <whistles> discount on the Upland Institute. So if you've been lollygagging, and if you're still lollygagging about training your own dog, can't tell you how many people write to me. Hey, Ron, do you know a trainer? I'm in here. I'm in Colorado. I'm in Utah. I'm in Nebraska. And I'm like, just get the Upland Institute and train your own damn dog. It's not that hard to do. So, yeah, that's what I've been doing. That's where I've been. Next week I'll be, okay, love you guys, love you girls, love you girls more. All right, everybody, this is a... This is a news alert podcast. Actually, it's going to be a, a lot about a lot of things. My guest today is John Steigerwald, and he is the Forest Conservation Director for RGS AWS. Uh, what is it? Great Lakes, Upper Midwest. What is the region, John? Great Lakes and Upper Midwest from Minnesota uh, over to Ohio. Which we don't, we don't, we just don't think of Ohio, but you got to, you got to, you got to pay attention to trees all the way down into Ohio. I do. Oh. God, where where are you coming from today, John? Where's your house? So I live in Northwest Wisconsin, out of a town called Spooner. It sounds like a fishing town. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, before we hit the uh, the record button, I, I told John I grew up in Chicago, and when you lived in the you know Chicago is very mixed with just a ton of different ethnicities. Ethnicities, anyway. Funny last names, basically, is what I'm saying. So when someone moved onto the block, like it would not be uncommon for my dad to say, um, a Yugoslavian just moved in over on 86th Street. Uh, you know, a, a, another jerk, you know, he always, and I picked up that habit of like, when I see a name, they're like, well, certainly looks German to me, might not be. But then I started asking John about his lineage. And apparently, not only did he come over from the, from from not he came over from Germany, but his family tends to, what would you call it? Like a legacy career you're in? You're in a th you're a third generation forester. I, I yeah, I think I think you can call it legacy. I just tell people it's it's genetic. That's why I tell it, people it's genetic. But tell me again, you just did before I hit record. With your career path, you, you weren't planning on following in your your grandpa's and your dad's shoes. You, you're like, yeah, so I don't, don't want to yeah. do that. I use enough chainsaws in my life. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a third generation forester. Um, I grew up on a, on a tree farm. Um, it's actually the 19th tree farm in the state of Wisconsin, still going to this day. Um, getting ready to celebrate 75 years of being the tree farm program. And I kind of, you know, it's hard, it's tough to work with family, it's tough to work for family. And um, I didn't want to be a forester. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, I tried to go down a different career path. Uh, tried for a while working on cars. Uh, realized that there was no money in that, um, at least at the time, and then uh, decided I'd go to college for political science. And I remembered, or I figured out, I hated talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured, like you know what, I'm going to go work with trees. Trees don't talk back; they don't have opinions. Um, there's okay money in it, and we're we're going to do that, and uh, just stop fighting it. Stop fighting the the genetic uh, predisposition right. to trees and forest. Because yeah, when you told me that, I was like, that sounds like a military family. You know my. My grandfather was in World War One. My my great grandfather, and I'm like, I didn't know that pe like forestry could pass down, but apparently, apparently it can. Oh, it, it, yeah, it can. My my uh, grandfather, he was the one that kind of you know started our family down that path. Um, before that, we were in the concrete business in Chicago. Uh, that was, I think, the family business. Um, but he, you know, during World War II, of course, that uprooted a lot of people's lives and and trajectories and their their careers and lives. Yeah. And he actually, um, he was on General MacArthur's staff as his staff forester. And uh, really? he became a, a big wig for General MacArthur because you're looking at, um, you know, of course, there's going to be the invasion of, of Japan. At least that was the plan. And, uh, you know, thinking post-war, you have to think reconstruction. Right. And so he was a staff forester, really tasked with figuring out how are we going to reconstruct Japan. And so he did a lot of error photo interpolation work. Um, looking at you know, where are the forest resources in Japan, how could we use that to reconstruct Japan? Thinking we're you know we're going to invade it and we're um, we're going to win this war, but we need to have a plan on the back end. So you know he he got a lot of skills and abilities there. Um, things that he took off then into his career, uh, working for 
at the time, Wisconsin Conservation Department doing, he was the chief air photo interpolator for the Wisconsin Conservation Department, which later become, became the Wisconsin DNR. Um, eventually he hung out his own shingle uh, as a private consultant. And then our family's still doing private, private forestry consulting today. But uh, I took a different path, you know, wanted to work more with uh, forest ecosystems, um, work with wildlife, uh, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations. So I'm, I'm where I'm at today. So you wouldn't say that every forester is an upland bird hunter, but every bird hunter should understand and appreciate a forester. <laughs> I, I understand and appreciate a for, forestry, foresters, and loggers, I think would be yeah. good, good to say. Yeah. You know, we're going to talk about, you know, one of the things that Katie sent in, in that in that email that we wanted to get this episode out there, uh, Chiquamon and Nicolette Forest, and it's called the Four Mile Project. Yeah. And, you know, my my high school version of reading her bullet points sounds like you're making a fire break through the forest. I mean, what, is that an accurate? What is the project? Give me. Give me the the real version of the of the four mile project. So, so the four mile project it, it's a forest service project on the Nicolay side of the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest, and so it, it's a project that the forest service put out um, for for public comment, public feedback, gathering input, so that they can um, go through the proper steps with getting this project approved and moving forward with it. it in total, it's a it's a little over twelve thousand acre project that the forest service is is pursuing. Um, there's different components of the project, and you see that com you know complex with a lot of forest service projects. Uh, this particular one, there's habitat management, uh, wildland fire risk reduction work. Um, they're looking at rehabilitating hunter walking trails, actually 36 miles worth of hunter walking trails on the Nicolay National Forest. Um, you know, in order to do that, there's going to be a lot of timber sales work. There's going to be, I believe, uh, fire break construction in you know, non-habit, non-logging type practice work as well. Um, but it's a project on, on the, the Schwamigan and Nicolay National Forest. Like I said, I went through all the approval processes and actually this past winter, the, the Forest Service started cutting on the very first timber sale as part of that project. And that was the Sunfish Timber Sale. Um, so the, the, the Forest Service is moving forward with this project. You know, they've been been a great partner um, on active forest management uh, on the Schwamigan Nicolay. It's one of the most productive forests in, in the United States. Uh, but this most recent project has come under attack from, you know, folks who have the opinion that all management is bad or most management is bad and prefer hands-off management um, for one reason or the other. And, um, you know, we're out here kind of trying to educate people, educate hunters, our own membership, people who are, you know, interested in bird hunting, what the possible impacts to shutting down this project or other projects on forest service lands could have for um our upland pursuits and and everything else we do out there as well of course i mean it um of course we uh we rgs members and, and aws members always always our eyebrows always raise if we think grouse but could, could you do the same like if you did a deer focused forestry project would it benefit like they always say how, you know, grouse projects or, you know, uh, secessional forest projects benefits all the wildlife, right? Yeah. If somebody were from, I, I know this is just a, a kind of a Ron question. If somebody says, if this was the Whitetail Deer Hunters Association and they had this project, would it look different for deer than it would for 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 upland birds and, and, other, and other animals? You might want to say components of it would look different. You know, white-tailed deer are a little bit more of a habitat generalist than than species like like rough grouse, a lot okay. of rough game birds, and a lot of your non-game species too. You know, they're 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 really our habitat generalist. So you know, in general terms, if you're managing for some of these species that are a little more habitat specialists, you're going to be benefiting those habitat generalists as well. You right. know, and your, your generalists are white-tailed deer, uh, turkey. We we largely consider them in that that realm, but you still need some element of active force management because there are components that are that deer will use. Um, you know, thinking about bedding habitat or bedding conditions. Yeah, um, trying to have concealment cover for for fawns. Right. Looking at what is the browse layer? Like you have to have deer browse 
and close to where the deer can actually browse on it. So you have to manipulate the forest structure. So you have some early successional woody vegetation for the deer to, to browse on in the wintertime. You know, looking at things like acorn production. Um, you know, I like to I like to tell it, it's fun, always fun educating deer hunters about you know the intricacies of of acorns. You know, acorns are only available for maybe a month out of the year, and deer have to eat things throughout the rest of the year. But acorns are still a really important food source for deer and, and for turkeys and for rough grouse. Rough grouse will, you know, think of the size of rough grouse, they they do chomp down acorns. They can be Yeah. a really Yeah. important I never food have in figured the diet. out how they do it, but I've, I've seen them in the crop. <laughs> <laughs> but but you have to, you know, we're losing our oak forests in, in the eastern United States. And if we want to have those important habitat components, we have to have a plan in place to regenerate the next generation of, of oak trees that then can go through successional stages that are good for rough grouse habitat, good for woodcock habitat, good for goldwing warbler, um, can function as deer cover, deer browse before they eventually grow up to be mature trees that start that cycle over again and drop hard mast for, for in the form of acorns for deer to feed on. So, you know, Yeah, where I was any, going, these forest projects are, are yeah, general wildlife projects, you know, I, where I was going and kind of a tongue in cheek was like, I think. we should have every deer hunter on our side as a member of RGS. I mean, if you think about it, right? Because we're not going to make any bad habitat for a deer. Well, that, that does kind of get into a little bit, you know, talking about this project. Um, like I said, th this project's coming in under a little bit of fire from sort of anti-logging groups, people who are opposed to active management. Uh, people just want to see, you know, not my backyard type of attitudes and, Yeah, and just don't yeah. want to see, see logging. A lot of it just comes down to, you know, education, but people sometimes are just predisposed and not wanting it. Uh, so... What RGS did, we, we saw what was happening and we put together a coalition letter with a bunch of different organizations looking at, um, you know, we're all kind of aligned on this project. We want to see it implemented. It went through the proper public commenting processes. We didn't want to see that public commenting process eroded by some of these groups that are now deciding to push back on this project. And uh, the National Deer Association was one of our sign-ons to that coalition letter uh, because as a group, they saw the importance of that. Uh, you know, in addition, pheasants forever, you know, even though it's not forced, you know, forest habitat is not pheasant cover. Right. They, they understand, you know, it, it's conservation. Um, it's it's hunter uh, rights and access. Um, in addition, we had Wisconsin sharp tail Grouse Society, um, North American Grouse Partnership, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Turkey Federation, American Bird Conservancy on the non, you know, um, Side, you know, the non-consumptive wildlife side of things. So. It, it, it's, it was a broad-based group of uh, 32 sign-ons to a letter pushing the Forest Service to ignore these attitudes from these, these opposition groups. The project's been approved and saying, we want you to continue forward. This project's too important. Well, that sounds so. We've got that one in the W column. Then sounds like is it. Well, we'll 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 see. You know, we've seen similar things from these type of groups in the past on other national forests where, you know, they there's the threat of litigation. There's always the threat, and that's you know maybe their purpose is they're looking to slow down the pace of the of the project being implemented, or halt it altogether. You know, even if it's a frivolous lawsuit, it would still slow that process down, make the Forest Service a little bit more weary about how they're uh, implementing the project. Right. So we, we decided to have a strong show of force to the foresters and say, there might be some groups saying that they're opposed to this, but you have just as many, if not more groups saying, we want this project. It's it's Right. too important for wildlife, the local rural economy. Um, it, it's it's important. You know, I it's kind of funny. I wrote down a note here. PETA versus public opinion. It's almost like we're fighting PETA. Uh, I mean, you know, like someone are these people just is it really more than just not in my backyard i don't want to look at a forest project i mean they're not truly going to climb a tree and hang onto the branches while you're chainsawing it like a pita person would chain himself to a you know but it's almost funny that we have as as hunters and conservationists we got to fight two camps here almost Yeah, it, it, I, I think it, it comes down to um, probably different attitudes and what, why somebody might be a member of, of one of those, those type of groups or um, be affiliated with them or be in, be in, in support of like their position. Like Mm -hmm. someone might just come down to might be a person who just, you know, they bought a house, you know, next to 
foresters' property. Maybe they don't want to see it, it, it cut. Maybe they, they don't understand the benefits to forest wildlife habitat. Right. You know, they, they might have their own investment in terms of their, their property value. They might think it, it's going to impact their home value. They're looking out for themselves. But we need groups like us who are looking out for the trees, the wildlife, the conservation work. And we, we need to say we need science-based management taking place. And this is why we're doing the science-based management in line with the Forest Service's mission. Um, because they have they have a mission as well, and it includes active active forest management. Um, so I, I think that's some of it. A lot of it, I think, is is just sort of misunderstanding of the the forest habitats and ecosystems. Some of the you know the hurdles that we're facing with some of our wildlife populations. Um, I think sometimes there's probably a hyper focus on the aesthetics of forests. They think everybody thinks that big trees are beautiful, and you know I like big trees. I, I I do. In in rough grouse, you know, you look at the habitat usage of rough grouse, it's not really young forest that they use. It's diverse forests. They use Right. young forest, middle-aged, and old forest. We we need all forest age classes to support, you know, our our quarry. Um so it it comes down to, you know, can we educate the, these folks? Can you educate some of them? Can you reach some of them through through some messaging? But Yeah. there are probably folks that you're just never going to reach. Um, for whatever reason or another, they have their own biases, their own predispositions to, to the project. So that's why a project like this has to have all that unilateral support. And how, how much, It, it, I mean, it's do why you it goes through a public commenting process because the forest service has to gather that public input, figure out what, you know, what are the concerns of people who are interested in this project and these opposition groups, like I said, it, it's been approved. They're throwing out, you know, there's been some articles and some, some newspapers in Wisconsin. There's been some, um, you know, radio interviews about it. They sent their own letter to the Forest Service, you know, calling this an illegal op logging operation. And you know, <laughs> like we're, your we're like your trespassers. yeah, yeah, really. And we're we're saying like like no, <laughs> we saw what the Forest Service did. It went through all the proper processes yeah. and improvement. It 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 got uh public it they got public input, they built that into to the project and they they put it out there. And we It was not. We're not at that point where we're going to rewrite history. We're not going back. Like we want that project continued forward. We don't want to see the public commenting process undermined. Right. Because we we have a we have a bigger issue then. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, you know, on on math, it sounds like, well, you're talking about 12,000 acres out of a million and a half acres, right? It sound, it's, it's a scratch, right? It's 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 a it's a drop in the bucket. And when you start looking at some of the. you know, the projects within that 12,000 plus acres, you know, not all of it, it's not 12,000 acres of clear cut. No, It, it's 12,000 no. acres of, of some clear cut harvest to regenerate the forest, create, create and maintain a young forest condition. There's some where it's, they're just trying to do some wildland fire risk reduction because they're worried about a big fire blowing up and ruining a lot of acreage. Because <laughs> we haven't so, had enough forest management over the last hundred years. Exactly. And some of it's some of it's just, you know, maintenance, improvement, cutting, uh, you know, forester term, we call it the thinning, Yeah. um, which is just to improve forest health, reduce disease and, and uh, risk reduction there. Mm hmm. Um, so it, it's it's not like this is, you know, a big 12,000 acre just on the landscape patch of a big clear cut. You know, we're not creating sharp tailed grouse barrens You're up not, there. yeah, you're, you're not chopping a hole in the middle of the forest. Like, Yeah. it's not going to look like a meat. In fact, the most people, they would never even see it. I mean, in, uh, in a lot of the areas, uh, obviously it would probably rub up against somebody, but. Well, and I, I talk about aesthetics, you know, and those are those are the type of considerations that any forester, any biologist builds into a project is, is what are the aesthetics of this project as well. It, there's, Yeah. there's, there's a box you check to make sure, did we have aesthetic considerations for this project? Are there aesthetic considerations? You know, is is this in the middle middle of the forest where we don't have those major concerns? Is it right next to a road, ATV trail, recreational area? Right. You know, those, those things, those things foresters consider. It, we're, we're not, we're not. <laughs> We're not dumb. It's a science. You know, we, right. we figure this out over a course of, you know, 100 plus years. I I hate to keep pounding on this public opinion and the, the, we call it these groups, but do they have their version of science against what you want to do? Or is it really just they don't want it? Like, is there a, you know, like with anything back in the day, you could have doctors back in the day that said, no, no, smoking... Smoking actually has some benefits, right? In the 50s, right? Do they have science on their side anywhere when it comes to...
I, I I think they they do, but I think there's there's tends to be a hyper focusing on one particular area of science that maybe proves their point oh, instead like, of looking at like again like we're we're really advocating for diverse forest management. We want young, middle aged, and old forest, and right. they just say the science says this is about old forest, therefore it must all be old forest. Yeah, um, yeah. So and, it's like and, the keyword is like old growth, like oh old, you know that that's well, kind I, of. I, I think there's there's this tendency even within like um you know I, I should back up a little bit and talk maybe a little bit about my background I, you know I do have a degree in forestry uh, but I do have a master's degree in ecology and you know a lot of the ecologists that that I know um through like my studies and professional career they tend to to get hyper focused on the pre-european settlement forest condition and that's kind of put up as like the the bars we have to restore these forests to pre-European settlement conditions. And, you know, back then we had on the landscape, a lot of bigger trees, but a lot of people don't realize we also had areas vac vacated of trees. We had no trees. We had young forest. We had middle-aged forest. It wasn't just big trees. Right. Um, and, and I think people get hyper-focused on this restoration to a, to some sort of pre-European settlement condition when, you know, really when we, we look at that as a management goal or objective it's quite different than what a lot of more of your contemporary colleges talk about in terms of maximizing e uh, biodiversity and species richness because we can do a better job managing for a broader base of species by managing for a more diverse ecosystem than hyper focusing on one sort of condition there's nothing saying that like the pre-european settlement condition isn't good but we can do better and we can do right. better through science by saying we're going to manage this particular way because we can actually maximize our species richness in, in biodiversity. Right. And these things were happening naturally from the beginning of time. I mean, forest fires and windstorms. And I mean, you know, that could look a whole lot like if you take it to a public opinion. We had a, a wind shear come through Muskegon County, Michigan, about I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. And it literally laid over, I don't know if it was 100 yards wide or so, but it literally laid over trees all the way, like from Lake Michigan to, to my house. Now, that wasn't pretty either, you know? Well, well yeah, in, in, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of that, you'd have those, those large stand replacing events. Yeah. You know, think of a forest stand, you know, a group or you know, a small section of, of trees. Those large events would take place, whether it's, it's wind throw or, or wildfire, you know, right now in Northwest Wisconsin, we're having a budworm outbreak um, in some of our older jack pine. And that's, you know, that's going to lead probably to a wild and fire event, which is going to be a stand replacing event, which re initiates that that uh, forest successional um, yeah. trajectory. It's going to reignitiate younger forests just as a natural process. But all the all the while, historically, and, and the data supports it, we had uh, frequent low intensity disturbances as well mostly you know conducted by native americans in the form of prescribed burning you know they they maybe weren't going out necessarily you know like a forester would now today or a biologist would today having a you know a, a checklist of okay this year we're going to burn this one this year right, we're gonna burn this right. one it was more of like you know that berry patch isn't doesn't produce like it used to we, we need gotta, to burn that. we got to burn or, yeah. or you know this this stand of, of trees um we used to be able to see our, our game through this, this stand of trees. It's grown up brushy. We can't see more. Light it up. Burn all the woody vegetation. Restart that. Yeah. And actually, i got to move aside a little bit. This tree cookie behind me, um, this is this is a tree that was actually part of my graduate research. Um, I looked at fire return intervals in northern Wisconsin. This, this tree uh, dated back to the 1700s. Um, actually, just a few counties over from this four-mile project. Um, on, on a particular forest, um, this tree actually fell over in a windstorm, and we we looked at the fire return interval uh, as indicating the tree rings of this tree. We can look back and actually find um, fire scars on old trees and correlate that to uh, a mean fire return interval. Basically, like how often did fire happen right. historically? Right. Yeah. And actually, on this particular site, it was every twelve years. <laughs> uh, we found that that I mean and pretty consistently every 12 years native americans were coming back in and burning that site before really large scale what, what kind of tree is that it looks like kind of a split off a 
it, it, it's a it's a red pine. So so this part here is a huge fire scar on this side, but just repeat it through history. That's a almost a 300 year old tree. Wow. Wow. And it, and it, and it fell down finally. Yeah. It, it fell down of, of natural causes, but it was part of a, a you know, a, a larger stand of, of timber that, that old, yeah. but it was part of that, that research that we looked at and we had other trees were going, um, you know, not quite as far back. We had other trees were going even further back. There, there's some fire ecosystem studies in Wisconsin right now, going back to the, the you know, the 15, 1600s, looking at fire return intervals. And wow. it, it's pretty consistently showing that, you know, some sites would burn more frequently, you know, some sites would burn, you know, maybe every three years, even um, sometimes you would have every year they'd be burned, but, you know, occasionally you might have periods where they didn't burn for maybe, you know, 50 years, but then just through randomness in, in nature and, and how uh, Native Americans were applying fire in the landscape, we had these, you know, relatively infrequent low disturbance events combined with those natural large scale disturbance events on our landscape. So, you know, people talk about the pre-European settlement and what that looked like. It's not like the fairy tale we were all taught in grade school about a squirrel being able to hop from, you know, the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River on tree right. tops. It wasn't right. just, you know, old growth, mature forest in time since memoriam. Right. <laughs> it was a diverse landscape right. managed by right. people in nature. Yeah, yeah. I you know, you said something early on about 10 minutes ago, you said browse line. I'm going to, I'm going to jump into a rabbit hole. When I'm, when I'm out in the woods, I remember the first time I saw what a, a browse line was. And I was like, well, that's weird. I mean, it's literally, it looks like somebody took a hedge clipper for as far as I could see. And the guy I was with said, he goes, that's from the deer. And I said, oh, bullshit. <laughs> He's like, well, yeah. <laughs> They can only reach a deer is only so high at the shoulder. They can only reach so high with their head. All deer are basically the same size. It's a hedge clipper. Is yeah. that is that a sign of an overpot? Or maybe it's too hard of a question to really is that is that a typical thing that happens, or is that a sign of an imbalance in in the woods? I would say it depends because mm -hmm. you know we we do in in northern Wisconsin, uh, UP especially northern Minnesota, we do have deer yard sites where deer will congregate in the wintertime yeah. and you you do get maybe unusually heavy browsing in those areas where mm -hmm. you get those really really defined browse lines usually you know you know probably quintessential would be like a cedar swamp where you know cedar is a definitely a preferred browse species of white-tailed deer you right. can get those very very clear distinct browse lines um, but you know i would say there are other areas where you can definitely tell where we have an, an over browsing condition. You know, I, I've in my career, um, I'm, I'm still a relatively young guy. I'm only 37, but still in my my career, you know, I've seen 30 year old red maple that are are five feet tall because you, and you can count the continuous browse on, on these these red maples where, you know, you might get just a, you know, in our glacial till just in a, an escarpment where deer just congregate on top of this this area. If for whatever reason and just really hammer the vegetation so it de it, it depends but yeah. you you yeah. professionals can usually tell um you know i'll do a little bit of pr marketing right now is that you know one of the projects that that rgs has going in, in wisconsin is we actually have staff in our state that work through an agreement with the wisconsin dnr through the deer management assistance program so we actually have have staff that go out meet with private landowners help draft their deer management assistance plans. And one of the considerations is looking at deer browse mm -hmm. and what we can do to um, maintain a healthy balance of deer population, improve the forest habitat uh, through that agreement with the Wisconsin DNR. And that kind of gets back to your question about asking about, you know, managing for rough grouse, are there benefits for deer? Well, there are, there are these benefits that are vice versa. We can manage for deer and it's going to benefit rough grouse as well. Right, right, right. Well, and you also had something in your notes. I mean, is there anything else we should talk about the Chiquamanin? Because I've 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 been in a piece of it one time. I, I've shamefully only hunted grouse a very you know a very short two three days. I so I have not spent a lot of time in there. It and I know this is another one of these questions, but I, I try to ask questions that are like the guys on the tailgate. You know? Yeah. There's uh, well, a million, like, million and I a half acres up there. Is it in is it in good shape or is it in real need of more work? 
I think I think there's there's always room for improvement, but the the Shawnee Nicolay National Forest, you know, in general, is doing a really good job managing their forest. I think compared to to other forests, we've been kind of blessed in Wisconsin where we haven't historically had a lot of opposition to the, these forest projects. There hasn't been a you know outside groups like like this coming in before. Yeah, a lot of people really they're they're still connected to the land in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota. Yeah. Um, and Michigan, but, you know, we're starting to lose that, you know, as, as generations continue to age, there are people who are more and more removed from the land who don't understand, you know, the active management components of it. You know, we, we're, we're losing hunters and conservationists and you don't have as many people who are nearly tied to the land in terms of, you know, working for a logging company, working for a mill. We've, we've had some mill closures. So you have people who are just removed from that process. You know, it gets right. back to, you know, old Leopold talking about, you know, his, his major dangers. And one of them thinking that, you know, food comes from the grocery store and, and heat comes from the furnace. We have people who are removed from that who yeah. haven't chopped wood, haven't grown a garden. And uh, I think that's, that's a major risk of ours in, into the future as, as our, just our demographics start to change in the state. I mean, that's a, that's a parallel with hunting as well. And, and yeah. things, right. They're, it's enough generations without a connect. Like I would say when I was a kid, I went to my grandma and grandpa's in Southern Illinois. So even though I was born in Chicago, I got immersed in this like country, rural, small town, like, but my kids didn't get it. And then their kids certainly aren't going to get it. So it is, it's kind of a, a snowball thing that sadly there's not a lot we can do other than trying to make awareness for this stuff. In, and I'll say a lot of the, the people I work with through our various agreements with the U.S. Forest Service, all the professionals that I, I work with with the U.S. Forest Service, they want to do good management. They they, right. they really want to. And it, it's up to us working with them to identify, you know, what are the hurdles and barriers to management and how can we navigate around those? How can we improve them? How can we find additional funding? You know, one of the, the major concerns moving to the future really are, are forest markets as those continue to change. Yeah. We've lost several large mills in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, there was a large mill proposal in Minnesota that ended up uh, falling through, not getting getting passed. So we're really concerned about the forest product markets in the future to help financially support active forest management. Uh, one of the projects we're actually doing right now with the Schwamigan National Forest, on the Schwamigan side of the Schwamigan Nicolay, is actually helping the, the U.S. foresters evaluate some timber sales they had that had previously gone no bid. And figuring out well, how can we um, take a second look at the, these these um, these projects, and uh, maybe improve the work that we're doing for wildlife habitat at the same time, making them more marketable to actually attract a logging contractor to come in and, and complete these projects. Because the other side is we we're going to pay for this work um, out of pocket, and that's not very popular you know, spend, <laughs> right. spending money on something, something that could make you money. In, in right. It's a lot, a lot easier to sell something when you're like, well, and it could pay for itself. That sounds like a good government project. Not many other government projects pay for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I would say, you know, getting back towards like the, you know, the attitude people being removed from, from the resource, removed from the ecosystem, you know, we, we do see that a little bit more advanced in other States. And that's maybe where I, I would like to touch on, you know, Indiana and a lot, a lot of the, the issues that are happening on the Hoosier National Forest right now. Um, you know, what I talked with you in, in our, our through email, uh, one of the, the things that that we're keeping an eye on right now with other conservation groups is there's a U.S. Senator, um, Mike Braun, who's looking at establishing what he's calling the Benjamin Harris National Recreation Area um, through actually Bill S-2990. Um that particular bill would establish a 15,000 acre block of the Hoosier National Forest as a, a wilderness area. Yeah. The troublesome part with that is that really he's trying to stick that particular bill into the existing farm bill. And usually wilderness area designation goes through its own public commenting process, public input process. And there's a lot of groups outside of even just hunters that are concerned about that particular wilderness project because, you know, bikers biking groups are concerned about access and their ability to to work on and maintain their existing bike infrastructure they've been told that they're going to be able to continue to, to maintain their bike trails but um they're, they're definitely concerned because it goes against a wilderness area 
So what is the point? Right. Yeah, the name area? wilderness area doesn't sound like you're going to have wheeled vehicles in there to me. <laughs> so, so th there's there. That's definitely something that we're we're paying attention to. We're letting uh, Senator Braun's office know that we're opposed to it. That other conservation groups are opposed to it. Um, you know, there I, I think he's he's looking to make some some favors in terms of putting that into uh, trying to stick it in through the farm bill, which again just is not the appropriate pathway for for wilderness. Uh, but but some of these same opposition groups or, or uh, attitudes have have come out in in Indiana on the Hoosier National Forest, pushing back on um, two projects in particular: the Houston South project and the Buffalo Springs project. Uh, Houston South actually did get litigated. Um, it went went to went to court. Um, RGS and some other conservation organizations provide some uh, additional uh, an amicus brief to the U.S. Forest Service about that project and, and our thoughts in terms of um, the benefits of that project. But it went, it went through the court system and really the court found that the Forest Service did actually do most everything that they needed to do um, to get that project through. They did fail in one particular area related to a, a recreational area, um, uh, a lake, and all they had to do is go back through the process in terms of uh, redoing some of the documentation and evaluation in terms of impacts. Yeah. And now they're moving forward with that project. But that that's sort of what these groups want to do is maybe not necessarily stop the management, but slow it down in terms of, um, you know, threats of threats of litigation. Um, all the while, when we look at acres of young forest habitat in Indiana, young forest has declined almost 72% since 1986 in Indiana. And, and that, that's according to, to what's called forest inventory uh, assessment data or FIA data uh, that's compiled by the U.S. Forest Service that's looking at the entire state um, yeah. in terms of, of, of the forest. Uh, on, on the national forest, it's declined almost 90%. Yeah, in, in other words, of, they, in a young if, forest habitat. If there was 100 trees there, they haven't cut 10 of them, basically. Right. Well, if if yeah, well if if, they, if 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 there were um if they had a hundred trees, they haven't cut ninety of them. <laughs> nine, nine, right, right, right. That's so right. so so really really like like we have these really concerning habitat issues in terms of the forest composition, the forest structure. We're not managing a diverse forest. It's too skewed towards the middle age and older forest side. Right. And some of these projects that, that we're, that, you know, we're commenting on as an organization, um, you know, to the foresters, what we want to see in some of these projects and you know, some of these projects I look at, it's abysmal, you know, they might still want to move forward the project, but there might be an, an eight acre regeneration of harvest on a 10,000 acre project. Right. It's a pimple. We, we need to do more than that. We can't right. like you, we talk about the, you know, this concept of pre-European southern forests. Those for, forests weren't being rotated through every 20,000 years. You know, no. they were regenerating much quicker than that. So like there's definitely a need, you know, for wildlife's sake to to be managing diverse forests that include young forests as part of it. Right. And and you would think like I almost when you, when you mentioned Senator Braun, I, I don't I don't follow politics too much, but it, it almost like why is 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 somebody just leaning? I mean, would you speculate? I don't want you to say anything to. Is some just constituent in the state leaning on this because they think this should be a wilderness area, and he's just like, okay, let me see what I can, or is I, he like a science based? Is he? Is he coming at this from a well older forest? Put more of this and that in the. I mean, what's he coming from on that? Do you know? I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna just maybe repeat what I've seen in other news articles. Um, yeah. And just what I've seen in other news articles is really examining that he's likely to make a run for governor in the state of Indiana. Okay. And so I think that's some of the discussion right now is is he looking to to you know make friends and stuff like that in, in Indiana yeah. for that gubernatorial run. And, you know, and, and it might, you know, the politics at all, you know, maybe he has no expectation of a passing in farm, through Farm Bill. <laughs> maybe, maybe he put it into Farm Bill because he might think that is the wrong mechanism. It'll get tossed out, but maybe he can tell people that, hey, he, uh, he tried. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, you can see where that would get some voters somewhere to, because we do have to think of public opinion all the time. Like you said, you're, you're up against public opinion on logging projects where they 
basically, you know, accused, not you personally, but of illegal logging, like, no, you're doing a, you're doing a sanctioned project, but where people were voters in his state would say, oh my God, he got us a wilderness area. I mean, they, they don't, they wouldn't even know what that, what does that mean? Wilderness area, right? I mean, to your average person, they, are they, are they picturing that they're going to be, uh, you know, what do they think? What like what do you think of if I say wilderness area? I just well, think I, an area I, with I, no I think in the terms of the Hoosier National Forest, it's maybe a hyper focus on um, tourism. I, I think people are thinking sure. like, like we'll, we'll we'll create a wilderness area and that's going to create a whole lot of tourism. Okay, but there, there's it, that's a double edged sword. However, you know, bird watching is one of the most popular outdoor recreation activities. You know, uh, state state agencies go through what they call their SCORP planning, which is like their state outdoor recreational planning. Mm -hmm. And all, many states identify bird watching as the number one outdoor recreational activity. Then one of the number one outdoor recreational activities that's likely to grow and continue to grow strong into the future. Um, and you you think about, well, we have a wilderness area. Uh, most of your, your layman's will think wilderness, great, birds the good crossover with bird watchers but if you just have you know a really homogenous forest of one age class of timber that's going to attract fewer birds right than this forest so if you want to talk ecotourism and you know in terms of attracting bird watchers in particular as one group you right. want to have a diverse forest that's going to attract many right. different birds to call that place home if you want to attract tourism tourism in that particular sector Oh yeah. So, so it, it it's I I think a lot of people who use you know ecotourism have blinders on or, or just are not really well versed in uh, conservation in um, ecology in ecology. Yeah, yeah. I know I did. Uh, now I we I, I have fifteen acres here, and I remember a friend of mine referred to it as an oak desert, right? And it was. It was all about the same size trees. When we got here almost 40 years ago, they were all pretty small. And we did a, a pretty nice timber sale three years ago. And I can't, it's so funny now, I can't see anywhere. You know what I mean? And they did not, they did not clear cut. They just select cutted, you know, timber for, you know, the, the mill. And he was only taking one side, you know, basically one size of oak trees. I can't believe the little change that happened here when you talk about birds. Like we're seeing birds we never saw before. We're seeing even just glimpses through the woods of clearings that we never saw before. It would honestly, it was quite boring. You know what I mean? You could you could kind of it was nothing but oak trees and fiddlehead ferns. And now there's blackberries grown everywhere, like on every side. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. If people could embrace that. Um it, you know, what one of the you know. The concepts really is that you, when, when you have an unmanaged forest, a lot of what you're doing is you're you're putting you're putting a lot of your resources into the canopy of those trees. There there, there are three things that really are are fixed things on the landscape that really influence the growth of of your forest or, or you know any vegetation, right. and that is light, that is water, and that is soil, and. You, you know, light is is the probably the number one resource that can really influence the vegetation. And all we're doing is we're we're putting that light into the canopy of trees to make larger trees and a bigger canopy. But we're not focused on the forest floor right. that so much wildlife calls home. You know, and and not not just you know thinking like like mammals and birds, you know, insects and vertebrates is is well right. called the forest floor home. And when we manipulate that vegetation. Either we do it, you know, through forestry practices, right? Ecosystem services practices like prescribed burning, or through natural events, it's opening up that canopy, letting that light hit the forest floor, and really influence the vegetation in that area. That's going to attract a broader spectrum of of insects and and birds. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concerns right now about you know our declining, you know, the bird population is declining, but also our insect population is declining. Yeah. Many, many insects and vertebrates call a young forest home. Yeah. You know, they're very, young forests are very ephemeral. You know, they're, they don't last forever. We have to maintain them. And our management for them is just different. We have to regenerate older forests into that younger age class. 
uh, to create habitat conditions for those insects or, you know, continuously managing some of those young forest areas to create those conditions. Yeah. Well, you, in those notes, you had something about moose work. <laughs> How do, what, <laughs> this sounds like I was trying to bring the deer hunters in, but what, what's the moose work? <laughs> So, so yeah, you know, one, one thing that, that we're really looking at in, in the Great Lakes region is part of our, our conservation strategy and, and how we're going about um, the business of conservation is we're looking at really what are all, all these crossover species? What are all species that benefit from similar type work in forest management uh, where there's good crossover with forest ecosystem concerns? And how can we kind of, you know, kill two birds with one stone in terms of can we manage it for moose and it benefits American woodcock or, or rough grouse. And right now, one of the, the big projects RGS is implementing is a project uh, known as the Moose Habitat Collaborative in, in North uh, East Minnesota. Okay. We're currently in the fourth phase of that project. RGS, we came in as the, the, um, the fiscal agent and the lead on the Moose Habitat Collaborative for the fourth phase. We may have a year left on this, this phase of the project. And we just put in for an application for phase five, uh, to the Lassard Sands Outdoor Heritage Fund, uh, ask request that the council fund a fifth phase of, of the Moose Habitat Collaborative. Um, before we we came in and took over the collaborative, it was actually the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association that led the, the collaborative. Uh, but it, it's a collaborative group made up of conservation nonprofit organizations like the Nature Conservancy being one, uh, the Deer Hunters Association, um, tribes are are part of our collaborative. U.S. Forest Service, counties, state yeah. is kind of a, a broad-based collaborative, but we're looking at managing and, and, and creating moose habitat, which the the moose habitat work that we do has great benefits for 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 rough grouse. Um, you know, a lot of hunters that that I hunt with, you you'll have your like your typical hunting spots for rough grouse, and but every now and then you've got like that you, you've got that place you kind of save where it's like if I'm having like a bad day, right. I can't just. If I can't find the birds, sometimes you need a place that's a little bit dirty, I call it, or a little bit messy. You know, yeah. that's where you might get, like, you get into some blowdown or something like that. Um, you get, you know, an, an aspen forest or aspen stand's got a lot of conifer growing up in it. It's just not like your typical cover. Right. And I can tell you what, you know, not not initially with the moose habitat work, it doesn't really look very uh, grousey or woodcock habitat wise but you get like five 10 15 years down the road man it it, it it's such great messy or dirty habitat it, it, it's it's phenomenal because uh, you'll have just patches of just just you know some old trees right next to just young forest right next to just no trees and it's just this great mix match of of, of forest yeah. age classes where you're you're finding rough grouse you're finding woodcock uh, the area we're doing actually, you know, it's, it's home to to spruce grouse as well. So it, it's it's a lot of of habitat crossover, uh, managing for moose with with, with grouse and woodcock. Uh, plus, we have the, the added benefit. Of the work that we're doing is helping to support the forest industry. And you know, yeah. one of our philosophies in the Great Lakes region is the more that we can support the forest products industry long term through some of the, these these projects for wildlife the healthier we're going to have our, our products industry to be, that's going to help have additive benefits, uh, continue to manage both our public and private resources. God, there's a lot to this. You've got a lot of layers to this onion there, John. You know? I do. It, it takes a lot of thoughtful planning um, to think about how we're going to look at strategies to, to do this work. Um, one of my colleagues, you know, he, he talks about random acts of conservation. We've got to get away from random acts of conservation. And we, we have to really think about our strategy. And I, yeah. I definitely agree with that philosophy. Well, yeah. And you, you, you kind of see something like, like an artist starts on something and they know what it should look like when they're done with it. And the, like, even, I would say even trying to convince people of, of ecology and forestry has got to be kind of like, no, 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 you're, you're not seeing this in four years. It's going to look like this in six years. It's going to look like that. It's like, it's hard to sell that long-term plan, but when, when I walked around with Mike Amon up in up you know up in Wisconsin or on Ashland a uh, couple a month and a half ago, you know, I looked at I looked at some of that habitat work they're doing, and I'm like, what really doesn't look 
looks like they're going to be building a Walmart in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that was just what they were doing for, for sharp tail grouse in that area. But it it's, it's a hard sell when your vision, you know what it's going to look like as it gets older and what it can do and the value it has where to the lay person or to this, you know, the public opinion, it, it, yeah, it, it's definitely a hard, it's almost a harder sell than, than most things I would imagine, you know, like it, I remember can be. told me one time, he said, you know, creating grasslands is easy. I mean, kind of, as, as long as somebody lets you do it. Right. But creating healthy forests, that ain't easy. I mean, in, in these days it, it takes, it takes the forest industry. It takes, it takes everything, you know, um, it does. When when RGS kind of I don't want to say change, but got more focused on on you know on forestry, right? They there was kind of a it was it went from a more biology to more forestry. It seems like it's just been the the exact right course to go down. Um, for- I, I I would agree with that statement. I, I think it's it's really it's really helped to improve our our strategies in terms of what we're looking at to, um, to get done on a landscape level. We're, we're, we simply have just moved away from, um, you know, not completely, but those random acts of conservation, those smaller scale projects right. really need realize we need, we need a landscape level approach. There's always going to be, be a, a place for, for, you know, we need a, a quick small project here. This is going to fix a really discrete issue or improve you know, an existing yeah. project, but we need to really be thinking landscape level. We need to be thinking about partners that we're working with, who yeah. we're working as partners and who we're being partners with is also really right. important. And so like talking about, you know, the Moose Habitat Collaborative, the, mem- you know, we're, we're partners with TNC. Um, we're working with tribes. We're working with the, with the DNR and Forest Service. You know, we're, it, it's also about who we're, we're partnering with. Yeah, but it's like I said, it's like watching paint dry, unfortunately, right? You know, it, it, it's not like you can just say, I, you know what, come back tomorrow. You're going to love what it looks like. You can't say that, you know. Uh, I always feel like, you know, my my friends that all live in the Dakotas and, and, I, and I do a fair amount of hunting out there. It's kind of like, and I could be completely wrong on this, but this is just, again, my my tailgate philosophy if you pulled everybody out of the state of North Dakota and just let it all go back to feral, it's going to be the best thing in the world for bird hunters. Right. But if you do that to a forest, you can't just, you can't just let it go feral. I mean, otherwise you're only going to get the few natural disasters that would happen. And and we've, we're so many, we're a century beyond even letting that even be a thought at this. Yeah. And, and- you know, and and I think that that kind of gets back to you know just recognizing that you know before Europeans settled the land, Native Americans were managing this land for you know for since time immemorial. They're they're right. implementing for prescribed 10, fire. They're, they were cutting trees down and right. utilizing wood. You know they 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 were utilizing and working on this land too, just yeah. in a different way than maybe we think of. Yeah, boy, it's just it's probably a good thing they didn't have cross cut saws back then because they they they'd have been the timber barons of. of but of but they summer. they they knew what they were doing with the tools they had available, and I mean, uh, you know, I, I I would love to to go back and see how you know how they were implementing prescribed fire. I, I think yeah. it'd be fascinating to kind of to learn more about. Uh, on one side, you could think like, yeah, they they were really smart, or boy, they had to be able to move quick because. <laughs> They didn't have the the weather service telling them what the wind was going to be for the next three days. But then again, maybe they did have their own weather service. Yeah. Um, on a lighter note, because I I always I always bring this up. I do it to nauseam. When I first met Ben, and he told me the small percent, minuscule percent of people who call themselves grouse hunters, even occasional grouse hunters, who are not members of RGS AWS. It, it literally floored me and it, it literally pissed me off. Like, how could you not be? So the, my plea is to my listeners, I don't care if you live in the Dakotas or Louisiana or California, join in these groups, even that little bit of, even that little bit of money you do for a subscription to the magazine, it, it keeps you up on the projects. It keeps you engaged. 
And I just always encourage people to, you know, to please. And, and I did this two years ago. A friend of mine came up with this idea. You know, when you get my age, you're, you're a little young yet. You probably have a, if your wife says, what do you want for Christmas? She's like, well, I could use this and I could use that. And I could, I don't, there's like nothing. I, I, I have everything I need. And I, my daughters all buy themselves a subscription to RGS, AWS magazine and PFQF. And that way, when I go to their house, there's a copy of the magazine there. So I got nothing to do. I can grab my favorite magazines, right? And read them. And and they are not, uh, you know, I mean, they they do a little bit of hunting. But I told people, the more people we have, like Istana Ranks and the email list, that's got to give you at RGS and all the groups just a little bit more wind in your sails. The last thing you want to do is see you're working hard at something, yet your support is declining. Yeah, I, I think, I think you know, you bring it back to this Forest Service project and talking about, I think, the importance of, of advocating for active management, sound science-based management on our national forests. Um, you know, it a letter to the U.S. Forest Service that says, you know, on behalf of RGS and AWS, and our 100,000 members is going to be a little more impactful than saying, you know, on behalf of our 50 members. Right, <laughs> so, right. so, you know, if, if if you care about, you know, just good, sound, science-based management that's taking place, maybe you've never even thought about pursuing rough grouse, but, you know, you might, might want to someday or your kids might want to someday. It's important that people are advocating for the management of these resources. Yeah. And it, it, it takes a lot of people who are, who want to see this work happen, who really care about conservation to, to help us make it, it happen. And now I want to break into like what we would call the fun part of everything here. Two things. I'm having fun right now. So well, I mean, not, I no, I am too, because I, <laughs> I will tell you, and, and I've said this on 30, you know, I've been doing this 10 years and this is my 10th year doing this. I was the guy that just went somewhere and thought it all just fell from the sky that way. Right. I, I never, thought of the word ecology. I never thought of the word conservation. I was like, oh, I just want to go hunting with my friends. So I love learning all them little tidbits, all them that that history of it. And for you, it's it's in your wheelhouse. Like you could I could see two foresters in a bar. They're the bartender's gonna say, hey, it's two in the morning, guys. It's time, <laughs> it's time to leave. And I want to go to that. Most people when I do a Zoom call with them, I'm looking at your back wall and you have that that slice of that tree that you talked about and the tree yeah. farm. But you also have something real near and dear to me. You have a Pep's Blue Ribbon sign with <laughs> looks like a grouse on it. Now, is that a re, is that a re, is that a redo or is that an original? Oh, that that that's an original. I picked up at a at a bar that was uh, getting rid of their stock. Oh, I, I, picked, God, I picked up I like a few that. of them. So, are you a PBR fan, or you have to be if you live in Wisconsin? At least you can't say that you're not. <laughs> it was my first legal beer. Uh, <laughs> and uh it was uh the beer i drank on my wife and i's uh, first date so that's great that's one thing i love more so than michigan i love living in michigan but you know i i grew up in uh chicago and we had a bar on every corner in the old neighborhoods and when i started hanging around with al harmeyer in cudahy wisconsin they had more bars per capita than any other city in the country and there was had to be more PBR, Pabst Blue Ribbon shingles out in front of bars. And still to this day, when you go through the North Woods of Wisconsin, you see those shingles hanging out there. And uh, I, I saw that behind your head there. I'm like, oh, man. Well, you, you know, that that's, man, you're, you're this is like on here. You're peeling back all these layers here. You know, I, I just got to <laughs> put in a little, little bit of a plug for, you know, history lesson for people who may not know is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of the breweries in Wisconsin, you know, used to, and some still are very much in, intertwined with conservation. Yeah. You know, in terms of like, you know, corporate partners, you know, the, the old breweries really understood the importance of managing healthy land because, you know, you think about beer, you, you have to have clean water. Right. To really have good tasting beer. Right. <laughs> And how yeah, do you, how do you get that. good you know good tasting water? It's it's properly managing your land, properly managing ecosystems. You know, we we have a lot of really old families in in Wisconsin, the brewery families who really supported uh, conservation. You know, back in the day, and we we still have a lot of 
um, you know, Audubon sanctuaries, um, uh, university buildings and, and those type of things, you know, named after people who worked in the brewery industries. And we, Yeah. we still have, have partners to this day, you know, RGS, we're working with, with, uh, um, uh, some, some breweries, you know, on, on occasion trying, trying to figure out ways that we can work with them on, on conservation projects. Um, we're, we're talking with Lion and Kugel's brewery. One of my past jobs, I work with Central Waters Brewery in, in Amherst, Wisconsin. Yeah. So, so th they're, you know, breweries, as far as I'm concerned, are, are great conservation uh, leaders on the, on the corporate side. And the people who who frequent breweries and taverns are also can be can be great to our cause. It, well, it, especially once, you know, the, the blaze orange people who invade northern Wisconsin in, in the fall, too, you know, Yeah, are taking some of that. up. you gotta have it. Let's talk about dogs. You you have Sure. a what is your visualist name? First of all, It is Hazel. Uh, she's Hazel. she's a four and a half year old female. Okay. What what uh, what put you on the Vigila path, or how did you get there? So uh, I I never really heard of Vishlas or considered a Vishla before, but one of my um, my coworkers, uh, Jared Elm, who's our uh, state conservation coordinator for RGS, um, uh, I I really I got to hunt over his dog uh, when I start, started working for RGS and really kind of fell in love with the breed. Really liked the hunting style, liked the closeness that the, the dog would work, um, the temperament. Uh, so my my wife and I we we kind of babysat his dog a few times just to kind of you know. you know, do we, do we like this dog's temperament? We did. Uh, then I, I started talking with, uh, uh, at the time, Dave Johnson, who was our, our, uh, state director. And he put me in contact with, uh, uh, Terry Ides, who runs Ides guides and Buffalo hides out of Fifefield, Wisconsin. And, and Terry's, Terry's had, uh, Vigilas for, for 30 plus years, he, he and his wife. And, um, Got to talk to him a little bit more about Vishla's and it just happened to be at that time he was he was uh gonna have a litter and yeah put put in for for a pup uh we were let down fortunately um uh, from that litter but a later litter that he did have we, we did get uh, a puppy and uh it, it's been great she she's I, she's a fantastic dog i love the breed just love like again like the um The closeness of that she hunts, the her her tendency to to kind of quarter off as, as she's hunting, um, really good with commands. So we've been really really happy with the visual She's breed. very she's very biddable. She wasn't a she wasn't a whole lot to wrangle in, but she had a lot of natural t ability then. She she came from good stock, I'd say that. There you go. Well, so so did you? I mean, look look at they look what they did to you. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you don't know enough. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I, I have a wire-haired visual, which is not a visual, Oh, but it's a half a visual, you know. okay. And I will say that I, I he I will say he does not do good in the heat, but I don't hunt in the heat that often. And uh I think he's got that those same qualities, you know. Um I've seen a lot of visualas that are super high powered. I mean, super high, but you can find that with short hairs and you could find it with every breed. Um, and, and it's, I like, I like the fact that we, we kind of have a, a relative, a relatively same. So if I ever get up there, cause my other thing I want to hit you up with, it almost seems unfair to be a forester and have a bird dog. Okay. Just I, I, unfair is not fair, but a little bit of an advantage. Now you've got to be spending a lot of time for, behind the desk. I'm sure on the computer as well. Yeah, You yeah, spend not, some not. time. You gotta be. You're spending some time in the woods for work, right? Well, don't don't tell Ben Jones, but whenever I get the opportunity, uh, Okay. I know he listens to this. Whenever you get the opportunity, Ben, I sneak out to try. I gotta find my own spots too, you know. So I I I get on the field when when it's opportune time um, to do so. But uh, yeah, I, I I hear what you're saying about foresters working, you know, working the woods, being being bird dog, have yeah, bird dogs and being hunters. It's a uh, Yeah, it's a little bit of maybe insider trading, you know, getting familiar with the Mm -hmm. a little the bit habitats. a little bit But I call it a perk of the job, you know. <laughs> how how is she i mean she obviously <laughs> born and raised in the grouse woods right yep. um did it do you, was it a pretty natural path for her I she made it easy. Um okay so so I you know growing up I had had some uh, a springer had some labs you know we we had other other bird dogs um but I I you know I don't want to say I never did a good job 
training in those dogs. Um, I definitely noticed the difference difference with Hazel. Um, I learned I learned a lot from her training her, and you know it, it was kind of a fun process, just kind of working consistently on on some of the training with her, and kind of working on these different elements of training, right? And then getting out in the woods with her and seeing her start to connect the dots about like how that training element kind of worked with that other training element. And then she, I mean, she would fill in the middle and it, like you could tell it that something a little bit more was happening. She's just a little more, she had a little bit more thought process going on and just watching her kind of connect the dots is a great part and really fulfilling part of, of, uh, of hunting. I, I feel working with a bird dog. Um, And, and I think a, a bird dog came from, um, I, I don't want to boast and break, just good stock, I think. Well, yeah, um, yeah. You want, you could, a person could make the mistake of buying a dog and not knowing what the background was because you want, you, you want the breed. And sometimes people get a little like, like oh, I want one for next season, but getting that right breeder and you sound like you got the right breeder. You know, you 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 kind of got what you expected, and maybe uh, maybe a little more because it was well bred. Yeah, and and, and it's it, she's she's been good too. I mean, and outside of hunting as well. I mean, she's just a good. Vichels are just good dogs. I think in general, just very personable. Yeah. They like people. You know, the other part I have to tell people, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna hunt for for a few months out of the year, but we have to live with this essentially wild animal in our house the rest of the yeah. years. I, exactly. I don't want a psycho. I you know I want a dog I can live with too. I, um. And it, so it's, it's a good balance that way. Um, we are, we are, my wife and I now, I, I do give my wife a lot of credit too. She worked really hard on, on the training side of it. She, she definitely did a lot of her homework, uh, work with it, work with the dog when I was on the road, you know, for, for work, couldn't, couldn't work with her. But, uh, um, you know, we're at this point now, she's four and a half years old. We're starting to consider our, our second dog to make sure we, we get a good rotation of, of dogs. in. so that was let's talk to the household right now is what is the next, next breed going to be? That was my next question. When's number two coming? <laughs> yeah, we're 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 thinking probably next next year uh, be be good good timing to get get our, our next dog. But it's just trying to figure out well what which breed do we want to do? Do we want to go with a Vishla again, or do we want to look at another breed? We've just been really happy with the Vishla, but uh, you know, life's only so many years you got uh, to be active, especially out in the grouse woods. Um, life's short enough just in general. So do you want to try other other dog breeds? Uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, possibly Wine Runner, um, uh, Brittany, or some of the other, other breeds we're, we're talking about. Um, well, as long oh, as you find a breeder who does what you like to do, you're 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 putting the odds in your favor. Yeah, you know, I would not go to Texas to get a Brittany, but <laughs> you know, no no offense for Brittanies in Texas. I don't know that many of them, or Oklahoma. But if you found a breeder of Britneys that was in your area and or when I say area, a couple, the upper Midwest is a big area. But if you find that breeder that does what you want to do, you, you're stocking the you're stacking the odds in your favor. And, and you know, my, my wife and I, you know, we we do hunt, you know, northern Minnesota. Uh, we, we do hunt, you know, for rough grouse woodcock. Uh, we, we've been making some trips out to the Dakotas for, for pheasant. Um we, we we have been getting into waterfowl as well, so we're not we're not completely ruling a lab either uh, when, when it comes to that. But it's uh like I said, you only have so many years to to enjoy, um, you know, hunting, fishing, being outside. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to try different things. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll I'll stop by sometime because um, I I can I can take two different paths when I go out west. I can go up and over, or I can go down and under. So I'll I'll come up and over. And uh, maybe you could show me one of your C spots, you know, <laughs> we don't, we don't even have to go to B just C because my dog's about a C. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds good. John, thank you for coming on today and enlightening us a little bit about, you know, forestry and ecology and the work that RGS is doing. Um, I, I, when I first moved to Michigan, I think the first banquet I went to was actually a DU banquet. And then right after that, like in many areas, one of my DU friends was a ardent, you know, ardent RGS person, and uh, I I found why I why I like hunting a bird that you know sometimes like you said you got to go to your your A spot because B spot and C spot just aren't producing birds. Where other things you could do in the country are way more predictable than grouse, but there's something magical about grouse and the woods they live in. 
Oh yeah, hundred percent agree. And if you guys keep cutting trees down and managing it right, we'll have my my grandkids could do a little grouse hunting. Sounds good. We'll keep at it. All right. <laughs> John, I'm going to let you go. Uh, Thank I got you. in the house here. Otherwise, I'm going to get in trouble because even at my age, I still get in trouble. Sounds good. You have a good rest of your day. All right. See you, John.